Hello and welcome. This is World of Wastewater, and you're watching part 15 in a series going over a wastewater exam, which you can find a link to in the description below. And if you're a fan of tardigrades, also known as water bears, hit like and subscribe. With that said, let's get started. A new horizontal centrifugal pump is installed. Upon initial startup, you notice the pump is vibrating heavily. What is most likely the cause? A. The impeller is worn. B. The pump is over lubricated. C. There is air in the volute. D. That is normal for a new pump. The answer is C. There is air in the volute. Centrifugal pumps are great at moving liquids, but by design are not meant to have air inside of them while running. Air can get into the volute a few different ways. An air pocket may have formed inside of the pump while it filled back up with water after being empty, or the pump was not properly primed before being turned on. Another reason, and this is a very common issue with centrifugal pumps, is that cavitation may be occurring. Cavitation is the formation of small vapor bubbles that immediately implode and cause shockwaves that damage the impeller and inside portion of the volute casing, which creates excessive vibration and noise. To explain further, when the static pressure on the suction side of the pump becomes lower than the water's vapor pressure, bubbles form. As water is moved quickly to the discharge side of the pump, the pressure increases, collapsing the bubbles. Your permit requires you to grab three settable solid samples per day. You grab and analyze five settable solid samples during the day. Which samples do you report? A. The first three samples grabbed. B. The three highest values from the five samples. C. All five samples. D. The best three samples. The answer is C, all five samples. You should always report each and every valid lab result you obtain, grabbing more samples than required, even if it's by accident, and then choosing which to report is likely a violation of your permit. Always refer to your discharge permit if you're unsure of how many samples you're legally required to analyze and report. Which of these analytical parameters have results expressed using a geometric mean? A biochemical oxygen demand, B, chemical oxygen demand, C, total coliform, D, total suspended solids. The answer is C, total coliform. Total coliforms are a group of bacteria that are found in the environment. They are not harmful in and of themselves, but their presence in water can be a sign of another group called fecal coliforms, which then could indicate even more harmful bacteria, such as the E. coli subgroup of bacteria. Operators commonly test for total coliforms as a way to ensure the safety of their effluent being discharged. In wastewater, there are two formulas we should know when thinking about averages. The most common one we use is the arithmetic mean, which is what most people watching this probably already use when needing to find the average of a set of numbers. We calculate it by simply adding the numbers together and then dividing by the number of numbers in the set. Now what you may not be familiar with is the geometric mean. The geometric mean is a way of averaging a set of numbers that takes into account their relative size. It is calculated by multiplying the numbers together and then taking the nth root of the product, where n is the number of numbers in the set. Due to how the geometric mean functions, it makes it effective for averaging bacteria concentrations. This is because bacteria can grow rapidly and the population may double one day and then be reduced to nothing via disinfection the following day. The geometric mean accurately accounts for these large swings in bacteria concentrations. The geometric mean can be a difficult concept to wrap your head around at first, so I will explain using two different examples. These are not real-life examples, but simply just a way to understand the concept. 
As a disclaimer, I will be talking about bacteria concentrations, but won't be using any units because I want to keep this as simple as possible and focus on the mathematical concept of this formula through the lens of bacteria growth. In the first example, we are given data that tracks the growth of a single bacterium organism every day for a week, but on the fifth day, we are missing a result. To find the value that we are missing, we need to find the average between day 4 and day 6. Let's try doing this using the arithmetic mean first, you know, the way we typically use for calculating an average. 8 plus 32 equals 40. Divide that by 2 and we get 20 for the fifth day. At first glance, that doesn't seem like a wrong number, but as you can probably see, it doesn't follow the pattern that we can see has been established. Let's try again using the geometric mean. 8 times 32 equals 256. And let's raise that to the power of 1 divided by n, which in this case is 2. This gives us an answer of 16. As you can see, the answer of 16 aligns with the pattern we can already see. So because we know bacteria can grow rapidly day to day, we can see that the geometric mean does a better job following the exponential growth of bacteria. For the second example, I want to show how using the geometric mean takes into account the relative size of the numbers. This is important to understand and is why geometric mean is used for reporting the average of bacteria concentrations. In this example, you have a set of four numbers representing the number of bacteria on four different days. So if we were to use the arithmetic mean to find the average, we'll get an answer of 278. And if we use the geometric mean, we get an answer of an average of 32. That's a pretty big difference. However, if you think about it in terms of the relative size of the numbers we are averaging, and remember that these are bacteria concentrations that can greatly increase or decrease day to day, it makes sense that 32 is a more accurate representation of how many bacteria there were over the course of four days. This is because out of those four days, the first three days the bacteria concentration was never greater than 100. So it doesn't make sense for the average to be 278 when only on day 4 was the concentration greater than 100. A biochemical oxygen demand sample can be removed from the incubator at 5 days plus or minus how many hours? A. 2 hours B. 4 hours C. 6 hours D. 8 hours The answer is C. 6 hours Biochemical oxygen demand samples should be incubated for 5 days plus or minus 6 hours. This is based on the current standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater that most certified labs in the United States follow. What is the correct temperature range in degrees Celsius for drying total suspended solid samples? A. 99 to 101 B. 103 to 105 C. 105 to 107 D, 107 to 109. The answer is B, 103 to 105 degrees Celsius. For total suspended solids, the sample needs to be dried at a constant temperature range of 103 to 105 degrees Celsius for over an hour. This is based on the current standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get through it. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then check out the others on this channel. If you want to help us keep making great content for operators, there's a link to donate to World of Wastewater in the description of this video. See you turd herders next time on World of Wastewater.